Uh, welcome, everybody. I believe we'll, we are about to start. I actually was waiting for the gentleman who's meant to introduce uh, our speaker tonight, but uh, I don't see him yet. If anyone sees Majid Johan, uh, sorry to call him out, please let me know. Um, okay, well, uh, welcome to the 20th Online Cultural Majlis. Um, as you know, we usually try and make Wednesdays for artists and Saturdays for uh, uh, non-artists. Not that Pascal isn't an artist, but that we try to expand the understanding of what culture is into, uh, into other fields. Uh, I will look over one more time for Majid. If I don't see him, then I will introduce the speaker uh, myself. Very well. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be hosting uh, a dear friend, uh, Pascal Minoret, who uh, I've known for many years. Uh, Pascal also hosted me very generously at uh, Brandeis, where he is now hosted. Uh, just in, was it in January or February, just before uh, the, uh, the world sort of uh, changed um, almost um, unrecognizably? Uh, Pascal is a professor in modern Middle Eastern studies at uh, Brandeis. Uh, he completed his PhD in 2008 from the Department of History at the uh, Université uh, Paris 1, uh, Panthéon Sorbonne. He also he joined the Brandeis uh, 2015. Uh, Pascal, am I allowed to say that you received uh, tenureship? Is that is that in the news or not? I'm not sure. So uh, congratulations! After three years at NYU Abu Dhabi and two postdoctoral fellowships at the Harvard Academy for International and Area Studies and at Princeton Trans Regional Institute. Uh, Pascal's research combines urban history and social anthropology. His latest um, uh, one, I mean, he's published so many books, uh, uh, Joy, Joyriding in Riyadh, uh, The Graveyard of the Clerics, and he's also worked, uh, people forget, on a very important book. He edited a book called The Abu Dhabi Guide, Modern Architecture, 1968 to 1992. This was published six years ago before the um, sort of architecture frenzy that we're seeing going on right now. And I hope that Pascal, through his presentation tonight, will touch upon that really pioneering work of um, study that he had conducted with students. So that was a new model that we had seen in the UAE, professor with students conducting research on modern architecture. Uh, before his doctoral uh, field work in Riyadh, where he spent three years between 2005 and 2007, Pascal studied Arabic with Huda Ayyub in Paris, uh, and his Arabic is uh, really immaculate, and I'm, I'm so proud to be, having, uh, to be hosting Pascal here. Pascal, um, go ahead, it's, uh, it's your show. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Sultan, for your very generous presentation. It's really, a, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here with everybody. Uh, I hope everybody hears me well. Um, basically, uh, so the, the, the story I want to tell you uh, today, tonight, for you guys who are in the Middle East or in the Gulf, uh, this story begins uh, on a parking lot in Soleimaniya, which is a neighborhood of Riyadh. And this in front of you is Prince uh, Abdelaziz bin Salman Al Thneyan. He's the mayor in Ri of Riyadh uh, in 1968, and he's doing a photo op in front of the office of Doxiaris Associates. Um, so Dox Doxiaris um, is um, the urban planner who designed Riyadh. He also designed 11 other cities in the country and several cities in Asia, in Africa, uh, in Europe, in the Americas, among which Islamabad, uh, some neighborhoods of Baghdad, uh, Tema in Ghana, and so on and so forth. And according to Rem Kulas, Doxiaris is, I quote, the first global urban planner. So this is our first group of characters. Uh, uh, the prince, the princes, the Al Saud, the Al Thneyan, and others, and uh, their European experts. Let's call them the modernists, because they believe in design, they believe in planning, they believe in order, in technology, they believe in authority. And then we have a second group of characters, um, and we're going to call them the anti modernists, right? And here, I mean by them uh, the joywriters, for instance, al Fahati. They're mostly young, they're mostly male, they are often unemployed, often underemployed, often with a nomadic background in a society, Saudi Arabia, which is dominated by settled people, and they're stealing cars and doing crazy figures uh, at top speed. So 
if you look at this slide, this is the uh, landscape of joyriding of Tafrit. Um, you have new developments in the suburbs of Riyadh or of other major Saudi cities with large highways. I mean, here it's a, it's a six lane highway that was just finished, fresh asphalt, um, street lamps. And then in the background, if you can see, there is a pop up uh, real estate office selling new parcels. So the asphalt is very smooth. It's like a blank canvas on which the joy riders are able to burn rubber. And the crowds, um, as you can see here, the crowds materialize all of a sudden. They cheer the joy riders for a few minutes and then they disperse when the police comes and they reappear somewhere else, right? In another suburb and it starts all over again. So in my previous book, uh, Joy Riding in Riyadh, I have analyzed um, the careers of these joy riders. And I've contrasted them with the careers of the planners, of the developers, of the princes, of the, of the experts who have built the city. And basically the book says one very simple thing. It says that joy riders have unbuilt uh, the city. They've deconstructed the modernist city. Uh, they've desanitized, uh, they've rendered anarchistic uh, a city that was built as a controlled environment. They basically made a mess out of the modernist city. Joy riders tend to do drugs and homosexuality, uh, they provoke the police, they're the masters of flash mobs, of pointless mobility, of disorder. And my next book, my new book, Graveyard of Clerics, which is coming up, um, coming up um, next month, um, looks at another group of anti-modernists. It looks at Islamic activists, um, which uh, since the 1970s have systematically criticized um, top-down modernization campaigns. And so like the jaw writers, Islamic activists have both deconstructed and they've taken advantage of those new spaces created by princes and by planners. They've basically turned the suburbs of Riyadh, of Jeddah, of Damma into spaces for organizing and for protest. And so basically the book tells, again, it tells a simple story or a story that you can sum up in simple, simple terms, uh, which is how they resisted what they call the graveyard of clerics, um, a modernized country in which Islam has become a religion that is controlled by the state and where the ulema have been put according to Islamic activists to metaphorical death. So let's go back to our uh, characters. So I begin the story with uh, the modernists on the, one, on the one hand, and then the anti-modernists. And what I'd like to do basically is to interrogate um, our new interest in modernism in the Middle East. Sultan, you just talked about uh, how there was a craze about modernist architecture uh, since a few years. And I'm really interested in in, in why that happened, right? Why are we so fascinated with modernist buildings in, in Riyadh, in Abu Dhabi, in Dubai, in Cairo, in Baghdad? <clears throat> um, are we fascinated because we try to look at a golden age, uh, at an age of possibilities and of potentially unending progress? Uh, is this nostalgia for the modern? And here I quote, uh, you know, Ezra um, Özyürek's uh, book title about the remnants of Kemalism in Turkey and the, the, you know, that modernist nostalgia. Are we trying to grasp for Nasserism uh, in Egypt, for Zayedism in the UAE, for Ibn Saudism in, uh, in Saudi Arabia? Or is something else going on? So basically the, the main question I'm looking at uh, is how can we, can, what can we learn from modernism? Um, what can we learn about modernism from Riyadh and from uh, Abu Dhabi? So let's go back to the beginning. Uh, this is Riyadh, central Riyadh in 1960s. It's a smallish city, uh, around 300,000 people by the end of the decade. And King Faisal is, is worried about two things. He's worried about rural migrations to the city and political unrest. And um, thanks to one of the kingdom's best uh, American friends, uh, A.J. Mayer here on the right with uh, Sheikh Ahmed Zaki Yemeni, um, uh, so A.J. Mayer is a professor of economics at Harvard and he specializes in Middle East capitalism. And basically the, the Saud hire Konstantinos Toxiadis. Uh, and Toxiadis, uh, that Greek 
urban planner, uh, studied in Berlin during the Nazi era. He was very much inspired by um, the work of Walter Kristaller, who is um, a German urban planner and architect and geographer, um, who has that idea of about the central places and that cities are central places that serve surrounding communities. So Kristaller has a very somber, very dark uh, story about him. And uh, um, he uh, joined the SS after, during the war and he planned newly conquered territories in Poland and in Russia. Uh, but Tuxedis basically was inspired by one idea that you have to plan communities uh, against cities. You have to plan cities in order to avoid the formation of big crowds and you have to plan cities in order to avoid cities basically. It's anti-urban uh, urban planning. So basically what Doxedis did, and that's, that's the, the, the image on the right, Doxedis took what's, I mean, the image on the left is probably known to a lot of, a lot of you, and it's the um, urban growth uh, according to um, uh, Burgess, one of the, uh, the Chicago um, urbanists and, and sociologists. So it's the, you know, the growth of the city uh, in concentric circles. And then Doxedis took this and put it in motion. Basically, he turned this into a linear city a city that would be that would never be crowded, a city in which you could always escape uh, to uh, to the outskirts, a city along the uh, along the, the highway, uh, basically, in which you dilute dilute crowd, crowds into spaces. Um, and so the master plan that Doxedis offered uh, the uh, the royal family of Saudi Arabia in 1971 is uh, a master plan for a linear uh, city in which you see in blue. Uh, this roughly uh, north-south um, axis. Um, and you can also see that the city is composed of uh, smaller units of these uh, square uh, super blocks that are each thought of as independent village-like communities. And so that comes from um, basically, you know, Doxeris's often orientalist ideas about urban planning and about what he calls the Islamic city. Uh, or the Islamic city of the future, which is what he offers uh, King Faisal in the early uh, 1970s. Um, and so his imagined Islamic city is centered around the mosque. And the result in, uh, in the space of Riyadh is a collection of super blocks in which, at, at the center of each of which, you have a space for civic, religious, administrative, commercial activities, and in which the, uh, the surrounding areas are uh, purely um, residential. And so that collection of super blocks operates a distinction between residential uh, zones and uh, other types of, uh, of zoning, but also a distinction between several types of uh, traffic, right? So if you look at the, at the super block, you have um, uh, basically faster car traffic at the, uh, at the periphery. And then when you enter the super blocks, there are no through streets and you basically uh, have to park your car and you have to walk at some point. What interests me here is that when you look at the uh, the origins of the superblock idea, again you find uh, you find a European genealogy. Um, you find Patrick Giddes, who is a, a Scottish planner, who basically planned um, uh, new communities in uh, British occupied Palestine and British occupied India. So Indore and Tel Aviv in particular. I mean, and the city that would become Tel Aviv. Um, and here. Uh, basically, you have uh, one of these uh, donut-shaped superblocks in, uh, in, in Tel Aviv. Uh, so, you know, this, what, what, what interests me here is that the superblocks allow uh, for population uh, dispersal. And, uh, oh, sorry, it, it allows for uh, population dispersal. It allows for, to put a, a, a smallish population into a large space, right? Because you have to put people apart and you have to separate them in space. It's a typical or it's an ideal colonial um, uh, tool. It's a tool for uh, uh, sprawl, right? It's a tool for the creation of a colonial landscape. But the superblock also allows for population control because of dispersion, because of, because of atomization of society. And again, uh, Looking at Riyadh from the point of view of uh, the urban planner, uh, the architect, but also from the point of view of the joyrider, was a lesson in critical urbanism. 
and it pushed me to look for the European roots of Saudi modernism. Uh, and so to do not like uh, Abdullah al-Ghazami, for instance, uh, or Awad al-Garni, uh, right, and here I'm quoting two very famous uh, Saudi uh, intellectual figures, one doing a, a positive genealogy of uh, al-Hadath al-Saudi and uh, Saudi modernity, and the other one doing a more critical uh, genealogy of, of the same modernity. Unlike them, I'm not looking at the, at the intellectual history of modernism, but I'm looking at the landscape history of uh, modernism. And the idea here is that the landscape, the built environment is more influential than ideas. It shows political power and power relationships at a given time, uh, and it also shapes actions and ideas. So my notebook, to tell you just a, a, a quick word about this, basically is about how Islamic activists protested against modernism, against what they see as authoritarianism, against top-down organization, top-down planning of society, against also the political hegemony represented by the relationship between the prince and the planner. All right, um, how are we doing about time, uh, Sultan? We're good. So basically what, um, what I want to move on to is, um, is talk a little bit about the, the Abu Dhabi project um, as well. And um, so I want to give you another example of how one can study the, uh, what I call the cement and concrete record, right? Or the, uh, the stone archive uh, of the city. So, you know, if you want to understand the, the history of a state or a society, um, you can go to the archives, uh, the paper archives or the, uh, the digital archives. But sometimes these archives are not uh, easily available or uh, they're close to certain types of researchers. And so um, in this case, you can do something else. You can actually use the, the landscape as an archive, right? And so uh, study the stone, um, the stone record, or in our case, uh, the concrete uh, record. And one of my favorite projects ever, and I'm really glad, Sultan, you, uh, you asked me to talk about this because this is really one of my favorite projects uh, like since I began uh, to work as a researcher. Uh, it was a short time project. Uh, uh, but it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's, yeah, I, I really love that, that piece of work we did in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so that comes, it, it dates back to the time when I was teaching in Abu Dhabi and with a group of my students, we started documenting um, modernist architecture uh, in the city. So what's interesting about, and this is, this is the cover of the, of the, of the book uh, that came out in 2014. It's bilingual, it's a guide to uh, a bunch of modernist, modernist um, uh, landmarks of, uh, of the UAE capital. And so what's interesting about Abu Dhabi is that, like Riyadh, uh, it was planned um, as a linear city. Uh, so Abu Dhabi was, was basically the, the, the work of two main planners. There is a Japanese-American planner, Katsuhiko Takahashi, and then there is Abdurrahman Mahlouf that you see here at the center of the picture. Uh, with Cheikh Zayed on the, on the left, and then Henri Kolbok, a French architect on the right. Um, and uh, Abdelrahman Mahlouf is, is an Egyptian architect and planner. He worked on several cities on, in Saudi Arabia, including Jeddah. And um, he also studied like Doxiadis in Germany, but uh, in his case, after the war. And um, he's also somebody who um, loves to design cities around smaller village uh, units, smaller, um, neighborhood units such as um, this, uh, this neighborhood, for instance. This is, this is, these are the two um, master plans of, of uh, or two representations of master plans of Abu Dhabi. Uh, so the, the, uh, on the left you have Takahashi, 1968, and on the right you have Abdurrahman Mahlouf uh, reinterpreting Takahashi's um, uh, massing in the same year, 1960, uh, 1968. Um, so what Takahashi and Mahlouf designed, and I guess that's, that's why I, I got so entranced in that, in that project, is, is a kind of a villa, a villa radios on the Gulf with towers in the park, uh, very local Corbusian, right? Surrounded by beaches and by waterfront uh, parks. Um, and uh, Taka, um, Abu Dhabi's old core was uh, raised to the ground, unlike uh, the, the old city of Riyadh, for instance, or the old city of Dubai, which are still there today. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a quintessential modernist city established on a blank slate, a blank page, where housing and construction have been centralized and controlled by the state for a very long time, giving it a very homogeneous 
uh, feel and look for a long time, right? So on, on the left here, you have a representation of Le Corbusier's uh, Ville Radieuse. And on the right, I mean, that's kind of a, it's a tongue in cheek uh, slide, right? Because that's, the, you know, that's what you see when you walk around uh, central Abu Dhabi. You basically are uh, walking uh, inside Le Corbusier's head, uh, so to speak. Um, so in the guide, we've documented this triumphant time. Uh, and we, we started with structures that were really not triumphant because they were actually being demolished uh, or they had, they had been demolished in the past uh, few years. So this is the same area, it's the central area of Abu Dhabi between, uh, the, sorry, before and after 2004. And so as you see, after 2004, you have these towers like sprouting out of the, of, of the urban uh, landscape and the structure of the real estate market changes uh, and basically several landmarks downtown are demolished. Here, the, the landmark that is demolished on the left is the fish market behind the mosque, um, uh, built in 1992 by Planar and Scarup and Jesperson. And uh, on the right, you have an, you know, the, the first campus of an international university that was put there at the, at the, at the, in the same spot, and that, that was the budding campus of uh, NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, so basically what we wanted to do is to document what was disappearing and or what had just disappeared and um, and to understand how the transformation of the city reflected on modern architecture. So commoditization of the real estate uh, domain basically meant that downtown was being transformed and that building were demolished. Another market disappeared, uh, the central market built in the 1970s by Abdurrahman Mahlouf, the planner of, uh, of Abu Dhabi and demolished in 2005 to build um, the World Trade Center, uh, three towers and a huge mall designed by Norman Foster. And the population of the central market, uh, which you can see is a very airy, very uh, airy, aerial, very light uh, structure, uh, is so the population that, that, that used the central market, both Emirati and non-Emirati, was basically um, displaced to make uh, uh, way for a, um, a global uh, commercial hub. So I'm, I'm going to show you a few buildings that we documented, and this is not a uh, this is not a, uh, a thorough analysis of architecture in Abu Dhabi. Uh, again, that was a very short project, but I I brought you um, a few slides so you can get an idea of of uh, what we worked on and what was there and is no longer in some uh, cases. Um, the next uh, building we documented was, was about to be uh, raised, and in the end it was not. And so that's the, it's the cultural foundation. Next door to the two markets that were uh, demolished, uh, it was salvaged and restored. And these, I took these photos uh, last time, the, the time before last, I was in the UAE, so last October, uh, after restoration. It's a magnificent building. It was built by Iraqi US architect Hisham Ashkuri from uh, TAC, from the Architects Collaborative. TAC uh, was created by Walter Gropius in uh, Cambridge. And basically this, this building is the most direct link between Bauhaus and, and Abu Dhabi. Uh, I give you only two, two pictures of the interior. Um, this is one stair uh, near the, uh, the, the, the interior theater. And yeah, I, I mean, what's there not to love? I, I, I don't even want to comment on this. It's, it's so beautiful that it speaks for itself. Um, the next um, building we, uh, we documented, which is really important for, for Abu Dhabi, um, is the, um, the, the bus station. And here again, I show in, in, interior pictures of, of, of this. I mean, everybody has, has an idea of what it looks like from the outside, uh, but it's also a wonderful uh, building to, to, to walk through and to cross. So this, this building um, was built by Bulgarian architects uh, coming from the Soviet bloc and uh, by, by the, the firm Bulgar Consult, which built two of the most charismatic uh, structures in Abu Dhabi, uh, the bus terminal here and, and the municipality. Um, so this is another view of the, of the bus terminal. Uh, French architects, uh, Colbock or Taillibert, uh, built uh, several structures. Here you have Sheikh Zayed uh, Stadium by Henri Colbock. And um, which is again, uh, yeah, there, it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to 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 match uh, the kind of vision to, to look at it as both uh, a medieval castle and a coliseum, 
uh, surrounded by moats and by large vomitoria, right? So uh, vomiting people in and out. Uh, and you can see those vomitoria here, they have numbers. Um, and for a long time, entrance was free at, uh, at, at, the, at, the main, uh, at the main stadium of the city. So after this uh, very swift panorama, um, and to uh, come back to our main question, right? Why the interest and fascination with uh, modernist architecture? Is it fascination with authority and order in precarious times? Um, is it fascination with the possible features that were opened by post-colonial regimes in Egypt, in Iraq, and in Yemen? Is it the fascination with the globalization of the very European aesthetics and projects? And sometimes we have to think about this as well. Is it, is it some kind of a neo-colonial fascination? Uh, or is it more aesthetically speaking, the fascination with, and here I quote Le Corbusier, the masterly correct and magnificent play of masses brought together in light? Uh, I would choose the last one, I mean, if I were to vote for modernism. In my work, I tend to work to vote for the anti-modernists. Uh, and I'm really fascinated by uh, what the anti-modernists have brought uh, to our collective imagination. Not only the joy writers, but also the Islamic activists. And by anti-modernists, I don't mean um, pre-modernists, or I don't mean uh, the traditionals, right, or the trad or, or backward. I mean people who have understood the, the software of modernism, and who have decided that a society could not be built on it. I want to leave you on a last very modest slide, uh, which is two buildings in downtown Abu Dhabi. I don't even know if the one on the right is still standing. Um, in Abu Dhabi, what's interesting about modernism is that it didn't remain an official architecture. It became the vernacular of the city. Uh, so in France, you know, when you look at the vernacular and when you look at what ordinary people built, it's Neo-Provencal, right, with uh, tile roof and, and stuff like that. In the US, it's very often uh, Neo-Georgian, Neo-Colonial, Neo-Victorian. In Abu Dhabi, uh, it's Neo-High Modernism, and it is disappearing. So this is, yeah, the conclusion I wanted to bring this uh, talk to. I'm really um, happy to be here again, and I'm glad to take uh, your questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um... Uh, Pascal, uh, I think I'll start with the first question. Uh, I'm fascinated by, with your research in the history of Abu Dhabi, the modern history. I also would like to ask you about how, how you went about it. How did you uh, select the students? How did, it, uh, how did you find the information? This is 2000, I suppose 2012, 2013. Did you have to access information from the municipality? Was it uh, word of mouth? Was it one of the students? Can you tell us maybe one or two anecdotes on how that came about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, thanks. Uh, basically, I didn't select the students. The students selected themselves. That was, uh, it was a January class, uh, so one month long uh, class, during which um, we decided to work on the project and do, to do something, to create something. So the students wouldn't get away with, uh, you know, a bunch of papers and, and a grade, but they would get away with, uh, with a book. Uh, and uh, so that was the project. Basically, we went about it by uh, walking around the city a lot in the very beginning, um, deciding to select some buildings that seemed much more important than others, by also reading about the history of uh, planning and architecture in Abu Dhabi and, the, and in the UAE, um, and by uh, seeing what we had to, uh, to look at in, in priority. Um, and then by interviewing some of the, uh, some of the actors. Uh, so one of my students uh, conducted several interviews with Abdurrahman Mahlouf, uh, and so that, that, was, uh, that was very, very interesting. She got access to some of his archives, um, so his personal archives. Um, uh, we also um, uh, visited the National Archives uh, and we got, uh, we got a very warm welcome at the National Archives. Uh, that was back in 2014. Interestingly, the next year, I, I taught the same class again. And uh, you know we the, yeah we didn't get that much of a warm uh, welcome. Uh, so the first year we we got full access to everything they had about modernism, and man that was a lot. Uh, I remember uh, employees at National Archives rolling out cartfuls of uh, cartloads of, of of documents and of books and of coffee table books, uh, and the students were amazed. The, the next year. Exactly a year after, everything they gave us was one DVD uh, with uh, basically 10 pictures on it. So, uh, so yeah, well, you know, it probably depends on who you talk to. Uh, 
but uh, so so that that that's the kind of access we got. And then building after building, students documented them from the outside in. There was a there was a very important ethnographic element to the class. They had to experience the buildings from the outside, but also to experience them as lived by their inhabitants. So they had to interview people living there. They had to understand what it means to live in or around a modernist uh, landmark. Um, okay, before I hand over the mic to uh, Rashid, someone is asking you, uh, Anne Sophie Lorenzo, could you make a, a modern architectural guide about Dubai and Sharjah? So, <laughs> if you're well, I'll let you answer that question. Uh, <laughs> Rashid, so, go ahead. Rashid is a, a recent graduate from uh, uh, Northeastern University. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for um, uh, Pascal and Sultan for organizing this and hosting this, and thank you for everyone uh, for your time. Uh, I just had a small question that might be complex in nature, which is uh, through your understandings from planning uh, Riyadh and Abu Dhabi, why do you think that GCC cities went ahead with the car uh, dependent model and large highways? Was it a sign of modernity and their idea or was it a pressure from uh, planners or oil companies or car dealerships like what was the main drive of why GCC cities went um, to a car dependent model thanks this is this is a really excellent question uh, um, so first of all there is a there is an element of context here uh, the, the historical context uh, screens cars cars, cars everywhere, right? I mean, we're in the 50s and 60s, and the fact that uh, most cities in the GCC have been uh, planned in their actual shape um, as uh, in, in this period of time in the, in the post-World War II era means that uh, the, the main model was, was necessarily gonna be implemented. Right? So there, there is this, contextually speaking, um, in back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, it didn't make much sense to uh, to plan uh, for pedestrians, uh, and so um, so that there there is that element. Um, the second element is that um, when you read Doxiadis, um, when you read it, his his, um, his, uh, his his master plans, but also when you read the the letters, the correspondence between uh, the planners on the ground in Riyadh and the planners back in Athens in their main office. So when you try to understand what kind of issues they had and what were their you know their ideals. Basically, they don't want a, a uniquely car-based city. Uh, what they want is to create um, these small village units, these super blocks, inside of which you would have to go uh, about by foot, right? And so the, the size of the super block is two by two kilometers. Uh, and according to Doxiadis, it's, um, it allows its inhabitants to go everywhere inside their community um, to walk everywhere in 20 minutes, right? Uh, 20, 25 minutes, which is, which is pretty optimistic if you think of slower people, but you know that that was his uh, his model. What's interesting is that this 20-25 minutes is also the 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 baseline he had in mind, thinking about the time it would take to to drive from one end of Riyadh to the other. Right. So it's exactly the same. It's 20-25 minutes. That's that's the goal. The 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 Riyadh of the future, so the Riyadh of 2000, according to him, was a city in which you could. Uh, go uh, see your neighbors in 20 minutes and you keep in, in which you could cross the city by car in 20 minutes as well. So it's kind of a dual, it's a, it's a hybrid city, right, that Toxiadis is trying to, to create. Of course, what happens is very different, right? And so one good example of that is, is how cars have penetrated um, inside the super blocks. Um, you know, when you walk around Riyadh, you have cars everywhere, right? uh, even in places where they were not meant to be, uh, even like a, you know, right, right, uh, right underneath your, your 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 bedroom, or right underneath your AC unit, or you know, it's, it's a, you, you, there are places where where cars were not meant to um, to penetrate. What happened, and I guess that's that's an answer to your question as well, is that without intention, right, there has been a play of several forces. So the market is one of them. Uh, car dealerships are one of them. Uh, the um, cheap. Cheap oil is one of them as well. When you can drive so cheaply uh, everywhere, why bother? Right? Why, why bother to plan and to, to fine tune your, your urban environments to accommodate pedestrians? So a, a series of factors uh, and also um, real estate speculation, real estate investments, and the fact that uh, developers, realtors have, have embraced um, uh, Doxiadis' vocabulary, but they've turned it into a way to mass plan uh, 
and less stress of, of land around Riyadh, right? If you look at the, the master plan of Riyadh that Doxed has created, it's pretty contained. Uh, it's basically one fourth of what Riyadh is today. Right? Think about it. Right? I mean, like developers have taken this and they've basically like as if they were like you know like rolling out dough, right? I mean, like they'd be rolling out Riyadh and, and using the same vocabulary. And so necessarily, the city has turned into a, a car-based city. One last point, uh, and maybe it's to blame Doxedis, despite his ideas, uh, his generous ideas about pedestrians. He talks about um, the fact that he wants to create a public transit network, and that's you know in the, in the late 1960s. Uh, he talks about it, he writes about it, they never put that down on paper. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Pascal. We have uh, the next question or intervention is from uh, Bill Bragan, who's the executive artistic director of the Art Center at NYU Abu Dhabi and a former colleague of yours, I believe. Go ahead, Bill. Great. Thank you so much, Sultana. Thank you, Pascal. Actually, behind me is an exhibition that your students did in the project space of a walk down Hamdan Street uh, as a follow up, I think, to the book. Uh, and I first want to just say that I've used that book as a guide for walking tours downtown. And I would love to see it sort of revived as a geolocated app, something that can really bring the buildings to life as people walk around. I think it's, it's been such an important resource. And I think important in terms of some of the sort of urban renewal of the architecture from the 80s and 90s that's, that DCT is now doing. Uh, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the transition from this period of sort of brutalist modernism to the sort of more contemporary postmodern architecture that is currently sort of taking over and, and in, in, some, in many ways jeopardizing this period of architecture and what what predicated that shift and what you think that that symbolizes and uh, is responding to yeah thanks well first first of all hi bill uh, it's good to see you thanks for for bringing the background this is really cool uh, i wouldn't i wouldn't have imagined that these were still standing uh, <laughs> um, or maybe it's a photo from back then uh, yeah probably more. Um, so yeah, your question is a, is, a key, uh, is a key political and contextual question. Uh, so my understanding and here, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not the expert on, on, on the architecture of the UAE. Uh, that's what I told Sultan when, when he asked me to talk about this, but he said, look, your, your guide is, is an important uh, document, so please talk about it. And I, I agree, I mean, I, I always talk about it with pleasure, but I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not the expert on this. And uh, we have a bunch of uh, excellent works coming out. Uh, there is uh, Rim, uh, uh, Rim Bani Hashem, who, um, who, has, uh, who has published on, um, on planning Abu Dhabi. And so, uh, yeah, there is a bunch of references out there that you can look for. But my understanding, my limited understanding, is that a lot changed a lot changed uh, in 2004 with, uh, with the death of uh, Sheikh Zayed. And with, uh, you know, I would say that this is the moment when, when you have a shift from modernism to postmodernism. If, you know, if, if we like uh, clear-cut uh, clear stuff, uh, which I usually don't, <laughs> but I give you, I give you the baseline. Uh, basically until 2004, um, uh, real estate is pretty uh, controlled in the city. Uh, you have the Sheikh Khalifa Committee that has been um, created in the, in the early 1980s to allocate land and to, uh, to guide uh, real estate investments. Uh, so it's, 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 it's modernist in the sense that the state is central to the way the city is organized. After 2004, uh, these mechanisms of control uh, tend to, um, to take the back seat and uh, more um, neoliberal, uh, let's say, uh, mechanisms of investments uh, take their place uh, with, you know, the desire to, um, to turn Abu Dhabi into a global uh, capital, right, into a global city, into a global locale, which, uh, which is an interesting proposition, but which Abu Dhabi was already, right, in so many ways, uh, and precisely thanks to that modernist heritage. So I guess, yeah, it's, it's by looking at the real estate markets, by looking at uh, what happens there but by looking at developers uh, and how they uh, take hold of lands and decide that you know a given structure is not worth um, uh, its interest and that it's better uh, to basically raise it to the ground and to and to and to which is a common story right i mean I, 
uh, I live in Boston where, where this is going on as, as we speak. Uh, I mean, it was going on as we speak, uh, as we spoke. <laughs> we would have spoken before the pandemic. Um, it's, it's, it's a common story of neoliberal, um, neoliberal urbanism. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, next, we have a question from Azam uh, Wazir, who's a graduate student at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University. Go ahead, Azam. Hi, uh, thank you, Sultan, for organizing this, and thank you, uh, Dr. Minori, for uh, participating today. I had a question, actually, to apologies to folks who are interested in continuing the conversation around uh, architecture and modernity. I'm interested, uh, I wanted just to ask you about the state of the field that you're in, sort of broadly speaking, Arabian Peninsula studies, because I know you've been involved in um, some scholarly activities around organizing conferences and so on. I, there's one in Yale at 2016 that comes to mind, um, if I remember correctly. I just want to know what your impressions of the field were like today, because you've done some really interesting cutting edge work on, on subcultures and now this, this recent one on Islamic activism. And I'm interested in this field uh, myself and that's kind of the work I'm doing at, uh, at Georgetown. So it's kind of interested in your impressions of the field today and where it's going. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much. Well, thanks for your kind words. Uh, I, I, I didn't organize the, uh, the, the workshop at Yale. I was, I was one, of the, one of the participants. Uh, but yeah, that, you know, that, that, was, that was a place where we were trying to, uh, to map out uh, new directions in, uh, in, in, the, in the field of uh, Arabian Peninsula studies. So I'd say um, two things. I mean, uh, first of all, the field has, uh, has, has seen a, a shift from a, uh, an approach that was traditionally centered on um, security studies, um, oil studies, and let's say jihadology or jihad studies, right? Uh, so basically the trilogy of uh, uh, oil, uh, Islam, um, and, uh, and, and security. Uh, and so that, that, that was the, uh, the, you know, basically the paradigm and, and this, this, the field has shifted uh, over, the past, uh, over the past 10 years or so to, um, to what are, in my view, more interesting objects. Uh, and so when we, we focus more on, as you said, subcultures, uh, we also focus more on infrastructure. Um, I would like to mention a, a wonderful book about Abu Dhabi that came out uh, uh, not so long ago by Gökçe Gunal. Um, a spaceship in the desert, which looks at uh, the making of Mazdar, uh, what it means for uh, urbanism, architecture, uh, renewable energies, <clears throat> but also our study of infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, um, so infrastructure studies is really a big, uh, a big part of, uh, uh, of this. Um, yeah, I'm totally losing the thread of what I was uh, saying, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, subcultures, infrastructure, I'm sorry, that, that, uh, that episode with the water just that's emptied my, my brain. Um, <laughs> 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 so um, yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks for giving me the time to, um, to pull myself back together. Um, another really important uh, field of studies is, um, is STS. Uh, and uh, the fact that we cannot um, look at the Arabian Peninsula um, as uh, a lot of the scholarship has done as basically uh, uh, a receptacle of ideas and techniques and, practice, and practices that were invented elsewhere. And so um, it's time to actually you know, look at, at the production of ideas, the production of practices, the production of technologies uh, in the area. I mean, that's one of the shifts that uh, Gaksha Yunan is, is doing in her book, and I find it particularly, uh, particularly fascinating. Um, urban studies has been also a big, um, a big moment in, the, in this shift, right? So instead of, for instance, looking at, um, uh, you know, why people become jihadists, right? I mean, like, like the old paradigm, like the old school, uh, what in their intellectual software makes them uh, makes them uh, violent, quote unquote, right? So the new paradigm has been to look at politicization in general, has been to look at radicalization not as the R word, right? Not as a bad thing in, 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 by necessity, but as a social phenomenon, a political phenomenon that happens in a given environment. And so the, the new paradigm has been to 
has been to mobilize um, you know, the resources of urban studies, of urban anthropology, of urban history to understand the making of, um, of, of the landscape as a political object. Right? And so um, we, when, you know, from a sociological perspective, uh, we, we deal in the Arabian Peninsula with highly, highly, highly urbanized societies. And so that's, that shift in paradigm was absolutely essential. It was necessary to start looking at, at societies from an urban perspective. So I guess that, that would be my short answer, right? So infrastructure studies, STS, urban studies and all its, uh, its dimensions. Thank you for these questions, it's a really important one. Uh, thank you so much, Pascal and Azam, for that uh, question. I wanted to go back to your presentation, Pascal. You mentioned uh, a statement that drew, drew my attention, and you said the built environment is more influential than ideas. Can you, can you elaborate on this? <laughs> yeah, so that, that's exactly what I was talking about, right? And um, so basically, the, it's, it's, uh, I can't elaborate on this right now, but my, 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 best, my best answer to this question is my, is my upcoming book, right? Uh, so uh, in Graveyard of Clerics, uh, basically I look at Islamic movements in Saudi Arabia. And as everybody knows, I mean, Islamic movements in Saudi Arabia, A, have been vilified for a long time, uh, by a series of different actors, uh, and B, have very often been read in terms of what they have in their, you know, what's in their minds, right? Uh, so, and the shift that there has been a shift between, you know, the old colonial Arab mind studies to the Islamist mind, right? And so as if it were okay to actually look at the Islamist mind and to, to decide that this is a thing, uh, but no longer okay to, you know, I mean, so it, so basically what, what I've been trying to do is to show that all these, that this focus on the mind of the Islamist uh, was, um, was, was uh, misplaced and that uh, basically we needed to ask different questions, uh, questions that have more to do with, uh, with space and with the environment and with resources. Uh, so here, you know, there is nothing revolutionary in doing this, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's basically one of the, one of the moves of, uh, you know, of, of, of uh, basically the, the sociology of uh, protest movements or you know, social movement theory to, uh, to basically move um, from the frames of, uh, you know, the intellectual frames of perception and understanding of the world to, uh, to looking at the resources and to looking at space and to looking at the environment as, as a key element um, uh, that explains uh, the politicization of, of groups and movements. So basically, yeah, Graveyard of Clerics is, is doing that shift and is looking at uh, Saudi Islamic movements, not as you know Wahhabi movements, not as Salafi movements, not as uh, you know uh, jihadi or, or Salafi jihadi. You know, God knows what uh, what labels are out there to describe these movements, but to look at them as suburban movements and to to look at them and to say, let's pause the the literature for a minute and let's realize that these are movements that are suburban. They use cars, they use the weird spaces of the suburbs, they use the weird mobilities that emerged in Riyadh over the past 50 years to basically organize and to be able to pass the ban uh, on, um, on organizations and on uh, associations that there is in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so basically that, that's my short answer, the long answer I did in the book. Okay, yes, buy the book, that's a good plug. Uh, <laughs> I'll just dip into the chat for uh, a minute and say that there's a there's a comment from Yasmin Hamad who says she loved the modern guide Abu Dhabi that you worked on and she wishes it was developed into a tour guide or expanded into a, th a third print or even a reprint. Someone mentioned something about an app. Uh, we have a, a, a reply from Fatma Suwedi who sent us a number of uh, books that she recommended uh, to a question by uh, Asma Bilhamar on books on this topic. So thank you for that. Um, Hind, uh, who's my cousin, actually, uh, she says that uh, Qatar, Saudi, and Al Ain were more horizontal spreads and, uh, until recently, and Kuwait was the same. And a number of people, um, uh, you know, stressing on how important your guide book is. We had uh, Fahd Al Umar who said that she asked why weren't any sidewalks planned in, in Riyadh. Um, I suppose you might have answered that indirectly, but maybe. Maybe uh, the question I will ask from the chat is, uh, speaking of the ruralization of Riyadh and the urban segregation it might have initiated, I would like to hear what you think of Neom from an urban planning perspective 
or as a statement or reference to political of, of political urbanism. So an uh, from an urban planning perspective. Yeah, I, I can't answer that question. I mean, I haven't looked uh, deep enough into, uh, into uh, the literature that came out about Neon. Uh, and you know, I, I tend to be, uh, uh, I mean, my, my training is as, as, as an historian, so uh, I have a hard time studying the future. Uh, but, uh, okay, thank you. So Maura James uh, from Harvard University says, maybe I'm overgeneralizing here, but it sounds like there are similarities between suburban Saudi Arabia and suburban America regarding space and organizing towards the political. Yes, uh, so this is, this, is a really, uh, this is a really important question. You know, when I was preparing that, um, this talk, I, I reopened my, my notes on the archives of uh, A.J. Mayer, right? Uh, so A.J. Mayer, author of Middle East Capitalism, <clears throat> whose project in life uh, was basically to bring uh, Middle Eastern societies, which he saw as backward and, and uh, you know, feudal uh, to the golden age of capitalism. Right? So he's a typical modernization theory guy, um, uh, typical you know, 1950s, 1960s economist. Uh, and there is one, there is one page. Uh, so yeah, in his archives, you find a lot of uh, a lot of notes that he took um, during, before, or after his meetings with key Saudi uh, decision makers. And so, for instance, there is a there is a, a handwritten note um, that he made during his uh, meeting with uh, Prince Saeed bin Abdurrahman Al Saud. So Saeed bin Abdurrahman is the brother of King Abdulaziz, and he was really important. I mean, he was Minister of Finance for a long time. And he was a really important guy um, uh, uh, to talk to when, you, when, when it came to, um, uh, you know, to urban planning and, uh, and so on and so forth. And basically in this, meet, in this meeting note, uh, uh, A.J. Mayer speaks about himself and he says, uh, let's uh, talk about doxiadis, right? So that's, that's the first reference to doxiadis in any document I, I found. But anyway, it, there is another note in which he writes uh, down, uh, and that's, the, that's a meeting with uh, Hisham Nader from the, the, the Saudi uh, Central Planning Agency. And basically he explains to Nader that, um, that what are we going to do with foreigners in Saudi Arabia? Right? Um, do we integrate them in, into society, like, uh, like in the US, uh, according to the model of the melting pot? Um, it's not possible and it's too risky. That's what he writes, right? Too many risks. And then the second option is to kick them out. Uh, but then before you kick them out, what do you do with them? Well, you put them, is, you put them in uh, ghettos. And he uses the term ghettos. You put them in ghettos to basically better control them. Right? So yes, uh, there are deep connections between the Saudi landscape and the US landscape uh, because of that very high uh, level connection, um, because of the fact that US experts have literally imported uh, some of their key ideas about how to make space, how to organize space, how to, how to organize repression, how to make repression palatable, how to make it uh, easy to swallow by society, right? Uh, well, if you, if you inscribe repression in space, in urban spaces, in everyday spaces, then people are gonna forget about it, right? Uh, if you don't even have to repress organizations because there wouldn't be organizations in the first place because people have been pushed to far away suburbs and they've been uh, totally atomized then repression is going to be a very sweet pill to uh, to swallow, right? So that's that's the uh, idea. And of course, there is, well, the, you know, we all know about Aramco, we all know about uh, Bechtel, uh, we all know about Ford. Uh, you know, Ford predates Ford Motors, predates all these societies, right? I mean, like they 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 they, they, they enter the Saudi market in the 1930s um, and they start selling, um, you know, selling cars and and, uh, and and agitating for the transformation of the Saudi landscape into a car-based landscape. So yes, it's a, it's a really important connection. Um, Pascal, building on Mara's question, we have Maria Alam, who is an independent researcher in gender studies, uh, Middle Eastern studies too. She asks, between the parallels of uh, suburbanization in the US and Saudi in the 50s and 60s, how do you think this affected gender constructions in both contexts? Yeah, this is such an important question. Um, it did tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous um, harm to uh, gender relations in both contexts. Uh, so to talk about the Saudi context, which I which I know better, um, we have we we have ethnographies of Saudi cities before they were uh, modernized, right? Ala Doxeris. So we have uh, uh, Turkey, for instance. Uh, 
very prominent Saudi um, anthropologist who wrote uh, in the 1970s and 80s about uh, the modernization of Renaissance. Uh, and she, um, she, she shows how uh, um, uh, the women of Renaissance were basically being locked up at home, uh, not necessarily by society, right, al as, as, as we tend to say, or not necessarily because of backward attitudes, not necessarily because of religious uh, ideas, but because of the landscape, because of the landscape that was being uh, swept underneath their feet and in which basically individuals were totally lost and had very little option besides staying home. Right? Uh, and so it's a really powerful deconstruction of a lot of, uh, a lot of ideas about gender construction that we may have um, on Saudi Arabia, but in general uh, about gender construction. And that also answers, uh, you know, one of one of Sultan's questions, right? I mean, like, this is this this is how we can see the inf the influence of the landscape or the la the impact on the landscape on how people act and, and how people think, right? Uh, so it's not necessarily about ideas; it's also about what you can do with your body in space. Um, Pascal, I think this will be my last uh, question, uh, but it's a comment that comes from several people. I fear uh, Al Mullah says, Pascal, your Arabic pronunciation is superb. So uh, my question to you isn't really related to urbanism or Middle Eastern studies, but can you tell us how you learned Arabic and how you mastered it so well? Thanks. This is an embarrassing question uh, because I don't think I mastered it that well. And it's a, it's, it's a very, 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 very difficult uh, language. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's easy to teach out in Arabic. It's difficult as soon as you open books and as you, you try to understand the, you know, the, 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 the deeper functioning of the language, you're faced with a, with a very high mountain. And so, but I, I'm still climbing. I'm still, I'm still climbing. I guess, you know, the, one of the, one of the key, uh, uh, ways to learn a language is, um, and that works for every language is to really take it absolutely seriously, uh, to basically learn it as if your life was depending on it and as if you know you really wanted to get to the top of that mountain even though it might take you a, a lifetime uh the easy the second answer to this is that i was plunged in riyadh um uh, for years uh basically alone and that uh it was either that or netflix but there was no netflix around and so I couldn't stay home and just watch videos. I had to go out and basically like do something with myself. And uh, I was in my mid twenties, so still relatively malleable. And I learned, I learned by absorption. Yeah. I really appreciate it, Pascal. Thank you so much. Uh, there, there's a question from Jude, which I'll ask Jude to email you, but I wanted to uh, thank you personally for not only accepting so graciously this uh, request, but also, um, uh, including the Abu Dhabi guide in your uh, in your talk, I believe it's a very important document. A couple of people asked where they can find it from. It's available online, I believe. But it is online. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, is it on part of the Find website? Maybe it's the Find website, yes, which okay. which is really hard to find. Uh, is, no, no pun intended. <laughs> ironically, it's called Find, but it's it's very difficult to find. So I will be posting it as well, maybe with the uh, with the presentation. But I wanted to thank you so much. Uh, I hope uh, thank you all for joining us. I hope you have a lovely. Uh, day and apologies uh, to those I couldn't take questions from. Uh, thank you all. All the best. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.